Okay, we're beginning. Awesome. Okay, so if you're out there in Zoom land, um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the restrictive airway illnesses, uh, restrictive airway disease. I know a couple of weeks back, um, I think it was Sherry who uh, shared with us about obstructive airway illness, um, like your asthmas, your emphysemas, your COPDs, that that uh, kind of illness. Um, and then I think Linda talked about uh, the meaning and importance of pulmonary function tests last week. And so um, I was gonna do some other lung conditions, but then Linda said, why don't you do uh, the restrictive airway uh, conditions and diseases of the lungs? and talk about the difference between restrictive airway and versus an obstructive airway. And this, this issue actually does hit home for me because my mother also had a restrictive uh, lung condition due to her, um, due to her very unusual curve in her spine which restricted how much air she could actually bring in because it was pressing on the lungs on one side and thereby it was very hard for her to take a deep breath. And so it makes perfect sense uh, that there, there's like two or three different kinds of restrictive illnesses. So let's move forward with that. Oh, I can do, uh, let's see, Tim, I can just use the carrot arrow, right? The right arrow. The right arrow. Here we go. Or space. Bar. Oh, space bar. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Did I did I get frozen up? No. Which one did you click? Oh, uh, enter. Oh, this just this one. Oh, the right gosh. arrow. Right arrow. Ah, uh, all right. Okay, so just to backtrack a little bit, then, or to you know talk about something that was mentioned, talked about a couple of weeks ago with uh, COPD, there are some differences uh, in the obstructive disease uh, versus a restrictive disease. Um, typically with something that's obstructive, uh, it's very hard to actually, once you take a breath, to blow off and, and get enough uh, of your uh, breath out when you, um, uh, oh, for heaven's sake, I'm fumbling over my words, when you breathe out. So during that respiratory cycle, you breathe in and you get a, hopefully a full uh, lung full of air, uh, COPD patients have a tendency to not be able to exhale very well. And so when we exhale, we blow off CO2 which helps keep our blood pH within a normal range. And when we can't do that, of course, our blood tends to become a little more acidotic. On the other hand, with restrictive lung disease, we, people with those conditions, can't get enough air in due to restrictions, either in, um, either in the way that the lungs um, has to do with either the pathology of the lungs, whereas uh, there's uh, so much scarring and so much, um, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, due to the d disease, there's a destruction of viable um, alveoli and a destruction of blood vessels that can actually interface with the alveoli. And what happens is it gets filled in with all kinds of other connective tissue due to the inflammation. And so that territory, the lungs becomes unviable. And so by that, there's less lungs, less parts of the lungs available to take in a deep breath. So in that sense, it's considered restrictive. If you have someone who's got scoliosis or someone who has 
such degenerative arthritis that they're bent over in an unusual position uh, that they can't fill one lung section or, or the other full of air. So in that sense, there's a restriction of lung space that can actually fill up with, with air and oxygen. So it's a little different mechanism going on than, say, asthma, which you have your passages become narrower and narrower uh, due to an obstruction. There's inflammation and swelling, and there's also mucus production. And mucus also acts as a block or an obstruction. Um, if you've ever, if you think about, if you think about uh, a mucus plug, and there are plenty of, all you have to do is go online and then type in mucus plug. <laughs> And while the whole idea sounds disgusting, um, it, a plug of mucus can easily block an airway passage and actually can block more than one. And so with this picture I show you here, the fact that this, see if I can get my uh, arrow on it, this one here is filling up with mucus. And so air can't successfully get beyond that. Be in yeah, there could be mucus, there could be, if there's an infection, there might be uh, pus production, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, if there's any cancer at any part of the lungs, that means too that there's an obstruction uh, there and that could produce, uh, that could produce mucus, pus, um, inflammatory, response, which could include other fluids. I mean, you're, we're talking about, you know, your immune system coming to a response. And by that, um, you, might, you might see a lot more of, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Oh, you might see a lot more fluid production in that area as well as mucus. And together, it can e easily block your airway. And um, yeah, I wish I had included a picture of that because you get a better idea what I'm talking about by actually seeing what they do with a, bron a bronchoscopy. And they go down and they pull that plug out. They take a picture of it and then they pull it out. It, it's, it gives you a better idea of how tenacious that can be. Uh, for whatever reason, whether it's COPD, an infection, pneumonia, um, uh, sometimes too, if fluid escapes the capillary beds and into the lungs, that's another form of obstruction. That's what I was trying to get at, Kevin, and thank you for that question. So there's two different ways you can experience airway disease and if you have if you happen to have both that's like a double hit that's a double whammy um so in either case you have a, a reduced ventilation which means for restriction you're getting less oxygen and just due to that restrictive process um now here's a nice slide that actually you know, in a simple form tells you the difference between restrictive and obstructive. Um, basically with the restrictive, you have a reduced lung volume to deal with. So you're not gonna get in enough oxygen, simply put. And some of the causes here, you might have a couple of immune things going on like rheumatoid arthritis or pulmonary fibrosis. Um, you might, if you have cystic fibrosis, that's a genetic form of uh, another restrictive uh, airway disease. There, there are so many, um, there's so many different causes. If any of you remember Bernie Mac, he had sarcoidosis and that is a form of restrictive airway disease. And he'd had it since he was a kid. Uh, and the fact that he lived all his life, even to the point, you know, um, where he was fortunate to live as long as he did with that. Um, 
I, I believe, yes. This was diagnosed when he was uh, teen or preteen. Um, and pre I guess it becomes progressive. And the thing about, um, I wanna say this fibrotic illness, like your cystic fibrosis, your sarcoidosis, uh, and your other interstitial diseases, there is no cure. So the best we can do is manage those for as, I want to say, productive and as long a life as you can possibly have. But there is no cure for either of those. Now, on the other hand, the obstructive uh, illness or obstructive disease that includes your COPDs and you have your bronchitis or bronchiectasis, your asthmas, um, there's a dilation in and around the alveoli, which is your, well, that's, that's your functional unit of your lungs. And there is a filling up either of, I wanna say there's fluid that can fill up and obstruct that passage of oxygen uh, into the, lung, uh, the capillary bed. And um, on the other hand, the movement of CO2 out of that into the alveoli to be blown off. And, you know, there, there's also, there's the mucus, there's fluid, there's dilation of the alveoli and the trapping of air that can't get out. That's the trouble with COPD and obstructive illnesses. And that's why they have such a problem blowing off air. And I want to say exhaling, they can't, they, they can't seem to to be able to do that in a normal fashion like you or I could do it. How are we doing out there in Zoom land? So again, this is kind of recapping the, the, the differences, uh, restrictive and the mechanisms behind it. Um, because what you're what you're going to notice is that both restrictive and obstructive have similar signs and symptoms. The shortness of breath um, overlaps both types of disease. Increased respiratory rate to try to compensate is also noticeable on both sides of the disease, uh, whether it's restrictive or obstructive. And then there's uh, there's the use of extra muscles to get involved to help blow off CO2 and, or to help bring in air uh, uh, in the restrictive form. So there's an overlap of some of the signs and symptoms that you're going to see. Um, so, yes, okay, I think I just, I think I just described that. Um, because for those of, for those out there that have smoked or ha are still smoke, which I hope you don't, um, or exposed to other irritants. And I want to mean, I want to say things like, uh, cancer causing, um, particles in the air or other things floating in the air that are, I want to say they will help block the airway if you continue to breathe in those things that are toxic and or obstruction, obstructive that are in the air, because they can get down into the smallest spaces and cause trouble. They can cause blocking of those passages. Um, what's that, pardon me? Now, virus, well, yes, fire smoke too, yes. And um, that causes a host of other things with it not just a burning in the eyes that you experience, but uh, irritant in the throat, the upper airway, uh, even before it gets down into the lower regions of the lungs. So yeah, not just smoking, but I wanna say uh, what's floating around in the air due to fires, chemicals burning, whatever the case may be. Um, and the shortness of breath that occurs on the other hand, on the other, um, type of disease, the restrictive, it's because those either you don't have enough viable lung tissue anymore to breathe out of, 
And that would have been something with sarcoidosis, for instance, like Bernie Mac experience, wasn't enough viable lung tissue anymore. It shrunk it, because of the replacement of different kinds of connective tissue uh, that either because of the mechanism destroyed capillary beds where exchange of error can take place and wasted away um, the alveoli, the smallest sacs where air exchange takes place. It's all filled in with connective tissue, non-viable lung tissue, scarring. Scarring can have, uh, when you think of scar tissue, you know, you think of things that happen after, uh, I want to say, a you've had a surgery and scar tissue forms in that place. Same thing happens with the, uh, uh, the, the process that goes on with the interstitial uh, tissue uh, and how it's affected. It causes the scarring as well as um, the filling in with connective tissue that doesn't breathe or is viable at all. So, um, that's that's why you're going to see the similar symptoms in both cases. I think it's fascinating stuff because, to be honest with you, in the hospital, there's such a focus and an aim on the obstructive illnesses. And not that it's to the exclusion of everything else, but um, for me, it, it, this draw, it brings home what people who experience autoimmune disease go through. And sarcoidosis is a form of that, um, as is some of the rheumatoid effects, rheumatoid arthritis effects on the lungs, as well as other areas of the body. So again, that's a hyperactive immune response. I guess boiling it down to a sentence or a few terms. So, You have, I have this broken down in a way that you can identify some of the obstructive versus restrictive. On the one side, you have COPD, and that can be subdivided into your chronic bronchitis and your emphysemas. But then there's asthma, and then you're, there's your anaphylaxis reactions that have the same kind of a blocking effect. Um, and some of the reasons too uh, might be symptomatic of choking, airway blockage, upper airway versus lower airway, mucus plugs, like I mentioned before, they're a very real thing. And the only way to get in to get them is to use a bronchoscope and visualize them, pull it out, and um, hopefully breathing eases from there. Um, and then, Covering a broad spectrum as any hyperactive or reactive airway conditions uh, due to allergies and exposures. Paul mentioned exposures to different things in the air. And if you, if any of you deal with allergies, for instance, that can easily lead to an asthmatic attack if it gets, if your allergic response gets really bad. Uh, and then, of course, there's your SARS 1 and 2 which we're still experiencing SARS uh, CoV-2. And then there's their, there's your pneumonias as well. Yes, Paul. What about odors? Is in, when I yes. Because when I used to be at work, uh, I think they didn't like it anyway, even if you didn't have any uh, kind of uh, medical conditions, but there was this, they, they didn't want us to microwave fish in the, because of the odor. And there was a guy who was as, had asthma with it. And uh, yeah, it was a big thing because he had to go home because he just, I mean, I couldn't take it either, but I don't have any. Right, but other right. people might. But yeah, but no. it's, it's a national smell. It's not a good smell. <laughs> I, I believe you, Paul. But yeah, you know what? They, they may genuinely have uh, a, an allergic immune type of response to that. And that pulls up a very good... I want to say um, another part of this, I didn't include odors, but I did include toxic exposures, which could be vapors, could be odors, because odor is like a vapor. You just can't see it. It's an odor. Um, and um, 
Yes, you can still have a response or reaction to it. You know, a few weeks back, I had an, an injection in my neck of a steroid and they draped me in such a way that as they prepped my neck, uh, I, I could, you know, I was having a response to the prep, the cleaning solution, which was, uh, you know, I, I told, I, I was, I said I was, I, I was gagging because it was so, it was so full of an alcohol that they use. I, I could swear this was like a hundred proof they poured over my neck. And I said, I said, you know, I said, Jesus, what in the world is that smell? And they said, well, it's the, it's the prep. And I said, well, I said, I'm not exactly having a good response to this underneath this draping that they use to do this as a sterile procedure. And they said, don't worry, it's going to pass. So the alcohol will, you know, it will, you know, it will evaporate. And I said, yeah, but down here, I said, I feel like I'm ready to choke, you know, because of the vapors. So, yeah, that is, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's, that's a good point. Now, restrictive airway, we're talking about the actual lung tissue, uh, which could be done at the level of the alveoli, or it could be the actual linings of the airways, like the bronchi bronchus and bronchioles. So in other words, it's those main branches off of the main, the trachea uh, that subdivides into right and left and subdivides again and again and again. Those areas can be affected too by the interstitial lung disease. Um, lupus, I forgot to mention that. That's an autoimmune response. Sarcoidosis, absolutely. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, all of those cause scarring and fibrosing of the tissue. That was a term I was looking for. Connective tissue wasn't the right word. Fibrosing, which is, uh, I wanna say not viable tissue and it becomes stiff and hard. And if you can imagine uh, a good portion of your lungs being stiff and hard and non-pliable, trying to breathe against that, not gonna be easy at all. Not gonna be easy at all. In that sense, it's restrictive. Now, scoliosis, I bring that up because if you've ever seen somebody with a scoliotic curve, and this is why I use the example of my mother, because she was bent over and it was due to arthritic degeneration. And she was bent over, down and slightly to the left. So she could never really raise her head up when she got into her late 70s and 80s. It got so bad. But that portion of the lungs was. Um, pressed you could no she could no longer sit upright or stand upright for that matter so the lung was compressed she couldn't take a full breath in and and in that sense it's restrictive it, you can't you, she couldn't use that portion of her lungs anymore so she was always pursed lip breathing and i thought well this is due to her chf but it's not the chf alone it's to the restrictive airway or the restrictive breathing issues that she had. Now, people with scoliosis are gonna experience that one way or another um, on one side or the other, or could be both. Because if somebody with scoliosis is bent a certain way and down, both lungs are gonna be affected by that. That may be a little hard to wrap your mind around, but just the way we're built and what happens with our bony structure can affect our lungs. And marked obesity, you don't want to think about that possibly having a restrictive impact, but it does. And this is why individuals who are markedly obese have trouble with sleep apnea. Pushes the space closed. Yes, it closes the space or it pushes against those tissues that we use to breathe. Whether it's a main passage or a sub some passage from there, it pushes against it. Uh, and it makes it harder to breathe. If you hold a lot of, uh, I want to say, if you hold a lot of tissue up here, tissue, if you have an awful lot of girth, it makes it harder to breathe against. Yes. And granted, you know, it, it's harder to pump blood through it. If you have a lot of it, it's harder to breathe against it because your lungs have to, 
lungs, rib cage, diaphragm has to react in order to get a deep breath in. And if you have a, a whole lot of additional weight here and up here in the neck, that's problematic. Um, so I, I had just, I'd heard stories about individuals who are very heavy and died suddenly in their sleep. And much of it was due to the effect that their airway closed off and breathing against it became impossible. So they respiratory failure set in and arrest and they died. And I, in fact, I know of a couple of doctors who were a little bit heavier that died suddenly in their sleep like that. And I ventured to guess that it had a lot to do with their weight as well as their condition of their heart, um, which is, that's, um, yeah, it's very sad. Um, now, another aspect to restrictive is neuromuscular illness. Um, I think most of you have probably heard of multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. or Lou Gehrig's disease, the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, and there's one other that I'll get to, who I don't know why I didn't mention here, but it also um, results in uh, poorer and poorer efforts of breathing because of the neuromuscular disease that's going on. Uh, in other words, you have the brain, the spinal cord, and you have the nerves that feed out. Well, those nerves degenerate. And if they degenerate to the muscles that help us breathe and uh, go, you know, the diaphragm, for instance, or uh, I want to say all of the muscles here that are uh, involved in breathing and expansion of the rib cage, the intercostal muscles, if they can no longer get a signal from the brain and the brain stem, forget it. Your effort of breathing is gone. Diaphragm can't move normally anymore. The intercostal muscles can't. In fact, if disease gets so bad, any other, I want to say, assistive muscles involved in breathing, gone. And this is usually a progressive illness. And by the way, MS, ALS, and this other disease I'll get to don't have, uh, there is no cure for those either. This is the sad part of the restrictive airways that there's no cure for a lot of these aspects of it. And I got a little depressed thinking about it and putting this together. I thought about, man, these, these individuals, you know, are up against, you know, they're, they're just up against their own mortality. Uh, and that has to be tough, very tough. Um, now, asbestosis, asbest, asbestosis. Uh, have any of you remember Steve McQueen? Uh, I think he had a cancer that was due to mesothelioma, but I think it was the asbestosis that caused this and it killed him early because of that. Uh, so that's like a, another toxic cancerous exposure to materials like that. Now so many things are not, they don't incorporate as, asbestos anymore. And if you have to work with it, it's under special conditions <laughs> that you're masked up and that you're, you know, you're taking OSHA precautions, et cetera. Um, or cystic fibrosis, which unfortunately is a genetic uh, type of uh, disease that uh, of course there's no cure for it. And what happens is it's also an interstitial type of disease, like some of the others, your lupus sarcoidosis, and over time, those individuals have a lot of trouble breathing. And most of those individuals don't make it past their mid 30s. Is that that white thing? I remember there was a movie, I think it was called Five Feet. Yes. The... Yeah. Uh, six Feet Away or Five Feet Away. Uh, I don't know if that's the exact title, but I think I know which title you're talking about. Um, yeah, that individual had um, an illness, I believe, that was either genetic or autoimmune, genetic. Yes, I think the 
Yeah. Yeah. I, again, you don't hear as much about the lung impacts of a lot of these autoimmune and um, these genetic illnesses because some of these have impacts all over the body. And I'm focusing only on the impact it has on the lungs and the restriction, restrictive part. And then there's all the other idiopathic, which means, you know, we don't have a known cause for it. It's, you know, it's what they then put into the category of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So again, this is a little bit of statistics. One fifth of all lung disease syndromes are restrictive syndromes. I looked at that number and I thought, wow, okay. So that's one in five or two in 10. That's 20% of lung disease syndromes are due to the restrictive illnesses of some sort. So that's pretty significant. Um, I already talked about the issues with air exchange um, and what happens there. And the contrasts between these blocking or blockage type and a restricted type. Um, you know that this is an illness that doesn't allow full expansion or use of the lungs, of the lung fields. Um, and by, by that, it limits the amount of air and oxygen into the lungs that can be used. Um, and some of the signs and symptoms uh, overlap um, COPD, but our demands for oxygen, you know, make it so that because we can't <laughs> take in enough air, uh, we have to try to breathe more, which increases our breathing rate, our respiratory rate. Um, so yeah, on the other hand, there's this 80%, 80% is accounted for by your obstructive illnesses. And uh, this is why you hear so much more about that than you do about the other. I'm almost certain of that. Um, now, you know, the normal respiratory cycle is affected by your, I want to say your weight and how that weight is distributed. If your weight is distributed in a certain area that's not going to affect the lungs, that's a different story. But a lot of us, when we get gain weight, a lot of it is up here, unfortunately. And that's where the impact on breathing and restriction comes into play. So really, the only thing you can do is hopefully get a CPAP, you know, for the time being, and then reduce weight. So you have to enter a, a, an effective weight loss program that will take away some of that extra weight and resistance that happens. Um, in order to correct that, because it is correctable. It is correctable. Um, the spinal conditions, the only thing, you know, there are ways of managing how you breathe and your oxygenation, because um, there, there are several different exercises you can use, but really it's a managing, it's, it's really only a managing type of um, way of addressing that surgery to correct the deformity is still the best way to make sure that, okay, now these lungs can expand again. They can be used, the actual lung tissue can fill up again. So um, at least those conditions have a good chance of reversing if they're corrected in these ways. Oh. Wrong button. So, yes. They could. I didn't include that, but that's possible. Um, uh, there, I know there are there are surgical procedures that will address that. But then again, 
in order to maintain the weight loss, you have to you have to change behaviors, you know, in order to keep the weight off. So that would mean, of course, you're addressing exercise, diet, maybe old habits need to change. Um, in order to effectively address this behind whatever surgical procedures. No, yeah, no. Right. Well, for, for the scoliotic curve or the abnormal curves, in many cases, only surgery to correct the curve will be a, an effective measure. In that case, yes, uh, you're, you're faced with few options. Um, you, you really are. And so to get the surgery to correct that might actually uh, you might have to undergo more than one. You might have to go undergo two and maybe three surgeries to correct the thing, to correct the deformity. And again, that's very complicated. Um, it's a very complicated measure. And it's not without risks, of course. Any surgical procedure has risks. Now, if you look at this picture uh, of restrictive disease, at least from the, the standpoint of deformity and weight, you can kind of see how the movement of the torso or the body in one direction is going to limit inflation of that particular lung field. And maybe both, like I said, you could be bent one way, but what if you're bent both this way and downward? Trying to get a full breath out of that is very difficult. Uh, if you can see the individual who has a lot of weight in his upper abdomen in the thorax, and um, I can't see around the neck, but likely this individual probably carries a lot of weight up here too. I mean, and that has a direct impact on your breathing and your airway. This is why a lot of uh, overweight individuals should be using a CPAP. If they're not, there should be. But then they need to address the issue of weight by losing it. If they can, lose as much as they possibly can in order to correct that situation so there isn't a wall around the ability to expand your lungs and breathe fully and against less resistance. Um, so that in that kind of a situation, the person can reverse it a lot on their own if they decide to do it. Now, the cases of neurodegenerative disease, simply put, uh, these, these diseases, which can be triggered by viruses, bacterial infection, inflammatory process that may or may not have anything to do with the neurodegenerative disorder, but can lead to a response like uh, MS or ALS. Um, what is happening there in a nutshell is that Progressively, the muscles get weaker, weaker, and weaker. And they're not just affecting our arms and our legs and our back, but it's also affecting muscles responsible for breathing. And a lot of these individuals, like the ALS, they'll end up with a trach, and they'll have to have help that way to breathe. MS usually it doesn't go that far unless the disease is severe. Now, if the disease is severe, they may be looking at something like a trach. But with MS, it's also progressive. And their effort to breathe uh, becomes, they're fighting a lot more to breathe. Even under you know mild to moderate exercise, their effort to breathe becomes uh, a lot more problematic. And again, ALS is progressive, MS is progressive. Both of them 
our muscle wasting and have a lot to do with what's going on with the nerves themselves and what's going on at the neuromuscular junction. Um, I mean, it could be that only some of the firing gets through and so there's a weaker response. But what happens eventually, at least in ALS, is that there's no firing going on at all. Like you, Stephen Hawking, ALS. Lou Gehrig, ALS. Many of them die. Uh, well, eventually they're going to respiratory failure unless they have the help of a trach and some other form of oxygenation and expansion of the lungs in and out. Eventually that will happen, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, and that takes place with a lot of other things that, uh, that are affected by ALS and MS, because it's not just affecting the lungs. Like I said, I'm pinpointing one area because this is a restrictive form, um, you know, simply speaking. Um, there's, you know, the lungs no longer can expand and contract there's a restriction going on uh, with that or a constrictive type of uh, mechanism in a way. You may have lungs that are viable, but the tissue doesn't respond. There's no response there. It's kind of like the, the sarcoidosis and um, some of those pulmonary fibrosis, uh, idiopathic. There's lungs there, but there is so much scarring there's so much, you know, I want to say tissue there that's um, like collagen or some other type of non-viable breathing tissue. There's the destruction of the capillary beds in and around what used to be normal looking uh, air sacs or alveoli. That's non-viable tissue and that area of the lungs can no longer uh, respond or react. It's more or less dead to expansion and use by breathing in and out um, in the respiratory cycle. So yeah, I got a little depressed looking some of this stuff through and realizing just the just the impact, just the impact on the lungs itself. But you know, anything that impacts the lungs will impact the heart as well. They're interconnected. So here's the one I was trying to think of, myasthenia gravis. This is another neuromuscular disorder that uh, has no cure. Um, yeah, it is autoimmune. There's so many illnesses out there that are autoimmune and anything can bring those on. Some inflammatory response, uh, about with a virus or a viral infection, maybe more than one bacterial infection. Uh, maybe it's a response to breathing in toxins or, um, oh my goodness, anything in the air your body might have an allergic or inflammatory response to. So with myasthenia gravis, um, Again, this also progressively leads to troubles swallowing, which ALS does too. Uh, they experience things like trouble talking, speaking, the vocal cords don't work very well anymore. There's the ability to swallow, that's impaired. Um, and if that's impaired, it's very easy to aspirate contents into your lungs. Um, and then progressively from there, um, you get uh, involvement of the mouth as well. Um, now you can think of everything from moving the jaw, the tongue, the back of the throat. And then there's the muscles surrounding and used during uh, breathing in the thorax. Again, the diaphragm is really important in all three of those autoimmune disorders. Without the diaphragm, without the use of the diaphragm, breathing 
you know, takes place by machinery. You don't have an effective diaphragm and intercostal muscles that can expand and contract or can move up and down, up and down in, in response um, and changing pressure patterns within, you know, the thorax that allow us to breathe. Depends on when it's diagnosed. And, you know, some of these illnesses don't get diagnosed until later on, like Parkinson's disease, for instance. That is something that usually waits until you're older, but not necessarily to show itself. And ALS, definitely something that shows itself in adulthood, but it might also do so when you're younger. Um, myasthenia gravis, I am not aware that that happens when you're young. I believe that happens when you start approaching old age. Uh, MS, now that can happen when you're younger. Um, yes. Well, yeah, I guess Gesna, it would, it would, it's, it would be a matter of what your, uh, your advanced directive looks like. <laughs> there is a lot, Linda. There is a lot of psychology. Uh, there's there's a lot of denial as well, um, and yes, the bleakness of the diagnosis that the initial impact is usually pretty huge. And um, the idea that you can survive this, though, there's no cure. There are a lot of measures uh, as far as medicines and procedures, et cetera, that can manage. And there's a lot of exercises that you can use uh, and put into play. This is where respiratory therapy comes in. Uh, someone who's a professional and helping you breathe as effective as possible, given your condition. And so that can help manage for a while, but not indefinitely. There is an end stage to nearly all of those. And, um, uh, you know, like I mentioned with Bernie Mac, he lived as full a life as he could, but his sarcoidosis, which he lived with for most of his life, uh finally uh you know took him and um so yeah eventually these conditions catch up with you guess my question is where's the training to help there there is there is training out there pulmonary does a lot of training uh pulmonologists of course Many of them are experts in, in a lot of these breathing diseases. Um, but for nurses, um, every floor can have individuals with breathing problems. They're spread out all over the hospital these days. And they all get a generic type of training. Um, <laughs> we all get introduced to these illnesses while we're in nursing school. Nobody gets through respiratory without being introduced to these illnesses and how they're managed. Now, beyond that is a, a you'd have to go for a specialty type of licensing or certification uh, when it comes to managing individuals in a pulmonary clinic, for instance. Um, where there are nurses who are trained, respiratory therapists who are trained to deal with individuals, deal with, to help manage, help these individuals manage their illness from the respiratory side of it. Because there are other sides, but the respiratory side of it, they can address. Um, yeah, but nurses don't come out of nursing school as experts in any of these areas. <laughs> 
not even COPD. Nope. But yeah, so I see that as a potential weakness, but then again, they have to get through at a certain, you know, in a certain, at a certain pace and amount of time, Linda, to, to graduate. Then it's up to the individual nurse to, if there's, you know, you see these kinds of patients, you need to go and get some additional education. Now, whether that be, you know, something that's continuing education or something perhaps um, that is, you know, seminar oriented to get more detail, um, which means you'd, you'd have to pay for these seminars to go where they're going to talk to you about everything interstitial disease. So you know a little bit more about it and what the impact is on, say, the lungs or the other body systems. So you know a little bit more about it. So a lot of that comes with educating yourself after nursing school. Now, you know, this is where lifelong learning comes into play. And I know I'm on a tangent here, but um, that's how nurses will learn. Started out working in the emergency department in the hospital, like her, paid for nursing school, and she's been continuing education. Um, as they, she started to specialize, they started to pay for that to encourage her to, to go as far as she could. Absolutely. And so, Absolutely. Because they already recognized that it's important. So they helped her specialize in the field that she specialized in. Exactly. And that individual person, if they're there and they're, they want to go in that direction, then they have to pursue it. And sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah, no, you're right. That's how they get it, though. Right. Hospital oftentimes will pay for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there are now, as far as, hmm, there's always education that comes with all of this. There's visiting nurses uh, associations that, uh, actually come and visit some of these individuals when they, you know, round on their patients at home. Um, yes, in some cases it is. Um, and the hospice nurses that they send around uh, are, a, they're, they're much more specialized in the area of what happens towards end of life. Because when someone gets put on hospice, um, yeah, and they, they tend to have kind of terminal signs and symptoms of whatever illness is. Uh, well, you'd like to think so, Linda. I would like to think so too. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> you know. Sacramento is very, very good. Yes. Yes. I agree. Everything I learned when I initially became a nurse, uh, the hospital paid for. And so I did my own breathing treatments, my own blood draws. Uh, I, I did my own IV sticks. And so anything you were going to deal with, they put me through a myriad of neurological classes because I had to be very knowledgeable in anything neurology, which included neurodegenerative disease. And uh, so I was a little more familiar with those than your standard med surgeon nurse because of that. But yeah, you're right, Linda. And I, I don't know what that picture looks like today. I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to stay on the positive, but I, I, I would like to think that people now are educated enough to know if they have an illness like this or these, that they're going to get their things in order, all right, which means ahead of time. So this is not something at the last minute you're addressing. Have those things addressed ahead of time. That's still not talked about enough, unfortunately. Still not addressed. So here's what's going on with ALS. Um, there is a destruction of the nerve 
And there is the inability of that nerve to actually cause contraction and action within the muscles. And so that's the biggest problem in ALS. Um, with MS, it's the problem of the muscles are getting weaker and weaker due to the disease, due to the illness, and their effort to, to breathe becomes more difficult. And fatigue with these individuals sets in much earlier than you or me. And with fatigue becomes, you know, difficulty in breathing, difficulty in swallowing, or just, you know, <sighs> engaging everything needed to breathe on a normal basis, even after mild exercise, it just becomes more difficult. So the interstitial diseases, I talked a little bit about those already. There's a lot of scarring that goes on and it's progressive. Uh, and then that, that tissue becomes fibrotic and is no longer viable. Uh, so it's kind of like, gosh, like uh, the da damaged areas of, in a heart attack. Uh, if they had a massive MI, but they survived, those, uh, those areas that are infarcted, see you, Kevin, those areas that are infarcted uh, are, you know, unless they have good collateral circulation, which isn't always the case, that area becomes non-viable. And with the lungs, it's the same thing with this disease process. Scarring occurs due to the inflammatory process um, and reaction. And then it's replaced by scar tissue and fibrosing tissue as well. No more capillary bed or just the capillary bed is destroyed. And the air sacs, a little alveoli, say goodbye to those they're no longer viable. They can no longer hold air and make contact with the blood supply. So, um, gosh, you know, I mentioned, we talked about a lot of the major reasons why this happens um, or with individuals with this disorder. It's an immune response. It's usually a hyperimmune response. Um, in many ways, uh, analogous to asthma, but it could be you already have some sort of, um, let's say you're susceptible to arthritis, especially rheumatoid arthritis, um, that goes against you possibly later on. Exposure to toxins, we were just talking about that. Even medications can bring this on. Um, infections, you have a, a hyper response because of a lung infection, heart infection. Uh, from then on, your immune system is going to treat everything like that, especially in the lungs if it occurs there. And, you know, the disease or the uh, degeneration is off and running. Um, cystic fibrosis, I talked about that. Uh, is a genetic disorder because once scarring occurs, it is irreversible. Once, once this illness starts, there's no really reversing it and there's no cure for it. So we talked about the triggers and there are all kinds of triggers. I know my wife, when she had radiation therapy uh, due to, uh, she had chemo and radiation because she had uh, everything removed, uterus, uh, fallopian tubes, um, part of the cervix. I used to tell, I used to call it lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> she didn't, she didn't appreciate that at all. So I didn't use that anymore. But that's what we used to call it in the hospital too. We said, wow, she had lock, stock, and both smoking barrels removed. Uh, I used that once with my wife, never used it again. Um, but Exposure to x-rays and radiation therapy found out after radiation therapy within a year, asthma set in. There's a combination of radiation and chemotherapy. Asthma set in. And the doc said, oh, yeah, that's a response to the asthma. And neuropathy set in. Well, that too is related to the treatment. 
She never had either of those conditions before those, that surgery and, and follow-up for the cancer. That's why she had everything removed. Um, so yes, we don't like to think about, but those procedures, those therapies can cause disease and can cause, it can trigger anyway, it can trigger something. So, oh my goodness. So the list goes on. Uh, the interstitial lung disease, this is kind of a good picture of it, uh, sort of, where especially in the, gosh, I wish I had a bigger picture of the sarcoidosis, but you have these granulomas, which are basically, they're, they're non-viable. There are collections of, uh, of inflammatory cells and, and they're all over. They're, with somebody with this disease, it's spread out all over the lungs. And so that area of the lungs, if it's concentrated, is no longer viable for breathing. So that's why there is that restrictive. That's why it's more restrictive than it is obstructive. Um, somebody with asbestosis you have those fibers and then there's an inflammatory response to that foreign entity uh and then scar tissue and fibrosine occurs as a response to that and guess what say goodbye to the alveoli <sighs> well that's a good question. I, I do not know the numbers on that. I'm sure someone knows the answer to that, or at least they know a ballpark figure uh, to exposures, lethal exposures, say. Um, yes, right. But I guess now uh, more, I want to say building, building materials now, of more recent time does not include asbestos because of the, that very reason. Um, so I, for an individual who knows they're dealing with asbestos and how could you be somebody who's a builder putting in floors or tiles or roofing or whatever the case may be, if you're not wearing the proper gear almost constantly, um, your exposure risk goes up. Um, I can't imagine those that treated asbestos, you know, with a simple, I don't know, paper mask. I don't know. Those who didn't wear anything at all, their chances, their risk of asbestosis, mesothelioma as a response, because these things are obviously toxic. It's not just going to cause an inflammatory response, but then it's very possible you're going to have a cancer form and start. So it's it's maddening in a way. It's very maddening. So again, this is more illustrative. What normal lung tissue looks like versus something that's damaged, fibrosed, uh, non-viable. You should see a normal clump of grapes, uh, which is the alveoli in this shot here. This is all disruptive. And in fact, the membranes around the alveoli are gone in some cases. They're just, they're not there. Um, so, you know, in cases of interstitial disease, the main interest here is looking at this. The fibrosine and scarring here prevents proper exchange of CO2 and O2 uh, into the alveoli and in and out of the lungs from there. So this is a big deal. Like I said, 20% of all lung illness syndromes are interstitial and restrictive. 80% are of the one that, you know, that we focus so much on, the obstructive forms like your asthmas and your various COPDs and a bronch, uh, chronic bronchitis and bron bronchiectasis and that. So again, the consequences are pretty big for, you know, heart and lung both. And I say that because 
uh, heart failure on the right side, there is a risk of that developing um, because it has to pump against more resistance in uh, the lung vasculature, if that makes sense, um, in order to get blood to those areas that are still viable and useful for um, um, inflating and exchange of uh, gases. So there's more pressure and that pressure gets backed up into the right side of the heart, namely the right ventricle. Respiratory failure ensues in many cases because you have some pulmonary hypertension going on. You have very low blood O2 levels. Uh, so the individual could go into respiratory failure. Pulmonary hypertension is, um, that, that is a direct consequence too, to what's happening with restrictive lung disease. And so that's a kind of hypertension, you know, seen directly from the lungs, aspects of the lungs and the right side of the heart. Um, so again, the hypertension starts when there's fibrosing or scarring of the lungs, uh, and it begins to restrict pulmonary vessels. So once you begin to restrict the pulmonary vessels, that's going to increase blood pressure. Uh, and blood flow to those regions of the lungs. So I hope that makes sense with, with the disease process going on and the effects that it does have on the vessels. So, oh my gosh, the risk, I know I'm already over time by a little bit. The risk factors and um, how the lung diseases are diagnosed some of it is age related, unfortunately. When, when is the onset of some of these diseases? Usually later in life, exposure to different hazards. GI reflux, believe it or not, um, also has uh, an impact in this or it has an effect on this, especially as it, as it has an erosive effect in the upper respiratory system. <laughs> when you think about it. Um, so smoking, of course, we all know about. Chemotherapy, radiation, yes. Those are huge risk factors because what comes after that is unpredictable. Now, this can, these, these kinds of diseases can be diagnosed with lab tests if they're looking for a specific autoimmune protein. Uh, or what do they do? The docs will simply go down and, with, and do a bronchoscopy and see if they can get a biopsy of the tissue and see what it is. Sometimes they can do it using the tube down the throat, or they may have to actually make a small incision between the ribs to get to the lung tissue, pull it out, and then examine it in pathology. Uh, sometimes CT scan can bring up pictures of the fibrotic lung tissue when it does its slices and cutaways, you know, of the region it's examining. Uh, and you can see that you can tell the difference between a healthy lung and one that's fibrosed. Um, echoes, if we're talking about, you know, using an echocardiogram, it can evaluate pressures on the right side of the heart which is in, can also be an indicator of some disease going on within the lungs. Could be that fibrotic disease is happening, the interstitial fibrotic disease. Um, so the, the echocardiogram is useful that way. And then of course, there's pulmonary function tests, there's uh, uh, simple um, non-invasive spirometry that, you know, it's kind of like what we use here, uh, we put it on the end of the finger and it tells us what our oxygen saturation is. You know, it's a non-invasive way of doing that. So the treatment options, you know, I already told you about the ones that are physical. The ones here that uh, are interstitial, um, again, there are, treat there are treatments and it would depend on the amount of scarring and how quickly or how soon you can affect the change, or at least 
start management, even though you can't reverse it or cure it, the earlier management starts, the better. Um, there are a lot of medications out there that help in the, the later phases of the disease. Uh, you know, there's gene therapy, so you, they can sequence your genes and, and find out, okay, which gene or genes does this disease come from? And do I, do I show this due to my, you know, um, the analysis of my genes and chromosomes? Does it fall on that chromosome with me? Am I a carrier? Um, well, there are still more studies with interstitial lung disease. I don't think it's nearly as studied as some of the COPDs and others. Uh, there are more studies identified out there, but boy, when I tried to look those up to get something um, of a current nature, um, they alluded to other studies that I could, didn't have access to. I may have had an abstract, but I couldn't go before beyond that. So I got a small paragraph says you must pay. So I couldn't get beyond that, but there are studies being done and there are things being looked into. So I just put this in a, you know, treatment uh, for ILD, which is interstitial lung disease. Things like pulmonary rehab is viable. O2 therapy is a viable approach. Some medications, um, again, some of these medications overlap your COPD, like the steroids, the uh, not the antineoplastics, but um, I want to say, you know, bronchodilators, uh, your steroids, the H2 receptor blockers, or some medications, proton pump inhibitors, to slow the erosive effect that um, your GERD might have on your upper airways, for instance. There's oxygen therapy, which is viable too. It's not a cure-all, but it's viable. There's the improving of pulmonary function, or at least maintaining, by learning good breathing techniques through pulmonary, uh, pulmonary rehab. And there's ways of getting emotional support. Uh, ways of trying to maximize what lung function you have left. Questions? I'm about 10 minutes over time. Sorry about that. I get, I get so engrossed in trying to come up with real life examples with things that I sometimes go overboard. So, <laughs> thanks. No, I, I, I welcome that. That's great. Actually, that feeds into this. And uh, I don't know if there's anyone out in Zoom land that has questions about this. It's fascinating stuff, really. Um, it piqued my interest when Linda wanted me to try to focus on the other side of lung illness and lung disease from the obstructive form to the restrictive form and what's going on with that. And I got intrigued with that when she said, explore that. I said, all right. So I put my other ideas aside and I looked into this and I thought, wow, there is so much to cover. There is so much there. Um, and um, well, for me, what I think I'll do, because I, 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 I always involved for myself, I'm an adult learner beyond nursing. I'm also someone who likes to go to seminars whether it's online or whether it's in person, I prefer in person, but, uh, or continuing education units, I put toward an area where, you know, there's an interest and a curiosity, and this is important or, you know, something very important to me too. So, you know, as nurses, that's how we find out and dig deeper. So if no other questions, um, uh, I thank you, everyone in Zoom land and everyone right in front of me for uh, looking into the other side of these breathing diseases. So fascinating stuff. Fascinating. The lungs, just like the heart, you know, amazing organs. But boy, when you look at the different syndromes and different disease processes, you're thinking, 
these are amazing organs, but look what can possibly happen to them. And, you know, but, and I know our immune system is wonderful, but boy, when it takes on a more active role and starts seeing healthy tissue as disease tissue, like it does in some of these interstitial illnesses, it's like, wow, what in the world triggered my immune system when it attacks other things and, you know, junk in my blood, my, my, my circulation, et cetera, and tissues, what causes it to attack my lungs or my heart or any other tissue for that matter, like my digestive system? What caused it to go crazy on me? Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> it's funny because a lot of people I talk to, they say, Rob, you ask way too many questions. Why are you even interested in that? And I said, well, I'm interested because I have a question and I don't get an answer. So I'm interested and that's why I asked the question. Yeah, yeah. And so I do my own research. I do my own study. I do my own opening books. I go to UC Davis's library. I have access to their medical library. I have a card key because I work there. I'm an employee there. I have access to their library, which is huge. Plus, I have access to Sacramento State's library, which is also vast. And of course, there's the online libraries as well. There's, there are tons of tons of articles, research, uh, you name it. Um, and the internet itself, whether you go to Dr. Google or wherever, Yahoo, and you type in the proper wording, you can find good studies and good information. So, you know, for me, that's kind of how it's been, you know, beyond nursing school and beyond grad school, I'm still taking stuff in. And sometimes I have to learn it all over again, to be quite honest. And I'm very humble about that because I forget things. So I have to learn it all over again, you know, or I have to ask a question. If I haven't done something, well, I have to ask a question. I, you know, I forget. Yeah. It's at your fingertips. So if you really want to pursue it, you can. That's a that, that's a very good that's a very good point, Gesna. Very good point. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well. I suppose that has something going for it. You know, it's kind of like, that's too much information or that's, uh, oh, you know, way too much. You're making this too complicated. You know, and I know we all do that from time to time, but still we want to know if we have a question, we want to get an answer to that question. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so I'm going to end this session. Uh, let's see here. I forgot, how is that done? Do I go to, uh, oh, stop share. Okay, there we go. And we're good. Awesome. So what do I do now? We're all done. Okay. So how do I save this to cardiovascular <laughs> wellness or has that already been saved? It, once we exit this, it'll upload it to the cloud and then. Oh, okay. The all right. Library. So if we exit this, we stop share, we stop.